So many developers create open world games and then brag about the size of the map or the number of random encounters that you might face along the way. But do we ever stop to think about these elements actually being a positive thing? I mean, sometimes tropes are seemingly thrown into these games because we just expect them to be there and nobody has asked if anyone actually likes them. So with that in mind, I'm Josh from WhatCulture.com and these are 10 open world video game tropes everyone is sick of. Number 10, manually picking up each resource and item. Between the prevalence of crafting systems and fetch quests, you're going to be hard pressed to find a game that doesn't require you to pick up items on a regular basis. And open world games are filled with random tat to pick up. From bullets in a radioactive toilet, to flowers in a meadow, to hitting a rock with your weapon to get ore, you're going to be gathering a lot of stuff in your playtime. And even in the best games, this can turn into a chore. I mean, I must have spent literal hours in Elden Ring picking berries that I never even looked at in the crafting menu even once. While this already feels tedious though, some games go even further by adding a collection animation each and every time that you pick up an item. Now, in a scan few games, this does add to the immersion. I mean, I never take it out of Red Dead 2, for instance, but something like Assassin's Creed 3, Far Cry 4, just let players auto-collect as they pass the item by. This is especially egregious if there's a disconnect between the types of items or collection styles as well. Number 9. Over encumbrance. Now, you can't risk an auto grab mechanic unless you deal with encumbrance first. We've all seen the memes about a Skyrim player with a backpack full of cheese, skulls, and weapons picking up a lone flower and suddenly being too heavy to move. If you can only carry so many items or so much weight, then picking and choosing what you carry is important. But by now, devs should know that gamers are just going to pick everything up that they see. You can never be sure what's going to be important, so the risk is worth it. Of course, you eventually have to do a clear out when you become over encumbered and can't move. And extra points to those games where the only way to get rid of an item is to discard it forever. I mean, at least let players sell it for a pittance or drop it to pick it back up later when they do have the space. I mean, they took the time to collect it after all. Sliding scales of encumbrance might be one way to fix this issue, that being the more you're carrying, the slower you are. But even then, developers need to consider the most important aspect of the debate. Does even having encumbrance in the first place make the game better, or simply more tedious? Generally, I reckon it's just tedious. If your game isn't survival horror or hyper-realistic, you probably don't need encumbrance at all. Number 8. Enemies you can only fight with other players. Open world MMOs are famous for those of massive raids and world bosses to the point that they're generally lauded as a feature of them. These are parts of the world or enemies you need to fight to advance the story or get an important piece of gear for your character, but with the caveat that they can only be defeated by a team or maybe even a small army of players. Even more egregious are the games that you can play entirely single player except for a couple of things where you need to seek out social interaction to win. Having fun playing this game with a tight storyline by yourself Yourself, well, if you want to get that extra special item you've had your eye on, you'll now suddenly need to talk to other people and set up a team. Otherwise, it's four hits and you're dead, but hey, at least you took the boss's health down by 4%. Number 7. Bad Map Design one thing that an open world needs, well, any world really needs in order to be explored, is a map. Whether it's the Soliton radar in Metal Gear Solid, the mini-map in the corner of your screen in a thousand other games, or the overarching map that you see when you press the pause button, your game just needs a map, that's just a fact. So many open world games have such poor map design though. From titles like Cyberpunk 2077 that make their map nearly unreadable with all the icons and logos sprawled all over it, or the deluge of games that thought not holding the player's hand meant not showing you where you were or giving any indication of locations. Something like Genshin Impact is the prime example of an okay map. It's not too over inundated with info like Cyberpunk or Assassin's Creed, but it's nothing really special either. However, this is guilty of another open world cardinal issue, having fast travels in the middle of nowhere. This allows you to be transported to a place with no important resources or quests. Meanwhile, a place you're going to be at for quests twice a week is a two minute sprint from the nearest spawn point. I mean, what the hell is going on with that? Number six, 
bad minimaps slash quest markers. So we've touched upon this in the last entry, but even a good map can be ruined by poor waypointing or an inability to easily access the map itself. I mean, after all, if the only way to get to your map is to hit pause, open items, select the map, then watch a map opening animation, well, we're gonna have a problem, friendo. Now, there is a school of thought that having minimaps in the corner of the screen at all is a bad UI design, and there are other people who say, well, minimaps are better than not having anything there at all. But a game just needs to balance how it gets you from point A to wherever point B may be located. For instance, Ghost of Tsushima's Wind and the Mafia Remaster's Road Signs when driving are excellent examples of something a little bit more inventive than a bog standard quest marker. Nobody wants to be staring more at a blue icon that a developer made on their lunch break rather than the environment that they spent years crafting. Number five, empty, uninteresting environments. One major difference between an open world game and the actual open world is that in the real world there's people and things to interact with. So many open world games though are just filled with nothing. A lot of games try to replicate a vast interactive world by just filling it with more enemies to fight, and all that does is make from getting one place to another a lot more tedious. Now, I like a lot of the modern Assassin's Creed games, but in something like Odyssey, so much of the open world is made up of similar looking forests filled with wolves that constantly hound you, and it totally sucks. Having a large open world is a selling point, but what's the point of a big empty space? Just Cause is criminal for this, having a huge player space, but making so much of it so forgettable that you won't even notice it as you skip over it via wingsuit. And all of this is really just masking the fact that open worlds are often dead worlds with no imagination put into how the environment interacts with itself. Number four, environmental glitches. Every game has some bugs in it, that's just a fact of life these days. One of the boons of the modern online era is that developers can release patches to fix them though, and often a few months after launch, things are looking good. Sometimes a linear game with very little room to deviate from the designated path will have a weird spot where you can clip through the floor, get caught on a wall, or shoot through a door but not through a gap in a railing. Open worlds, though, have so much open space and yet so many moving, interconnected parts to consider that even with months of crushing QA, it would be tough to find, not to mention fix, every instance of weird bugs. But the unforgivable annoyance is when these games are left for years with blatant glitches and they just don't get fixed. I mean, Fallout New Vegas is in my top five games of all time, but good lord, man, they just gave up on fixing all of those glitches, didn't they? Number three, illogical barriers. A lot of games have barriers to keep you from getting to places you're not supposed to be in, whether temporary or permanent. Sometimes it'll be an impassable river because your character can't swim, or even an ocean with no boats. And of course, there's the most dreaded gaming guardian of all, the invisible wall. A lot of games have flimsy reasons why you can't get somewhere, but open world games are the absolute worst. Touching on our earlier entry about dead, empty worlds, just try entering a building in any open world game, it's probably not gonna let you do it. That's fine though, we as gamers don't expect interiors to every single building we see, but one of the more annoying instances of this trope is having your assistant character say some variation on, let's not go that way slash do that thing just yet, and then mind controlling your character to walk in the opposite direction, literally just not letting you even experiment. This is seen in Ocarina of Time, Genshin Impact again, or even something like Persona 5. One of the more interesting versions of this though is the brine of Dragon's Dogma. Go too deep into the water, well, you're gonna get possessed and eaten by a magical man-eating underwater cloud. As you do, I guess. Number two, bad tutorials. Now this is especially the case in many survival open world games such as Conan Exiles or Life is Feudal. But even a regular game may come without a pertinent explanation of how your character interacts with the world. Many open world games in fact seem to feel the need to give you no guidance at all on where you fit in. There are two parts to this of course. The first is that the developers don't want to flood players with menu upon menu upon menu. That is definitely boring. And games that hit you with walls of text are just as bad if not worse than the ones that give you nothing at all. The second point is that developers want the players to experience the interactive features by exploring them. The problem with this though is that if you have nothing to tell you or to incentivize you to interact with something in a particular way, you might just miss it altogether. So this is is a tough balance for video game developers to get right because you can easily shoehorn your players into a guided mode of play where they only receive prompts in the order you want them to do things and end up getting bored
bored from too much guidance. But you can also leave them fluttering in the wind, getting bored from not knowing what to do. Number one, unnecessarily limited stamina. Your game has the largest open world ever created. The map encompasses over 500 square miles of mountains, rivers, cities, and plateaus, and the character I'm going to play as can only sprint for 25 feet at a time for being so exhausted that they have to walk at 0.5 miles per hour. Does that sound like something you've played recently? I know it does for me. Now, there can be beneficial reasons for including stamina in an open world game. When you're running from enemies, it makes things more dramatic that you can't run forever. Climbing becomes a puzzle because you have to determine which route to take and when to rest, and it forces the player to take a break and look around for more efficient routes to speed up their movement. But when you're rehashing the same section of the map over and over again, limited stamina can really grow annoying. Now there are good fixes for this, and one is to make stamina be situational. Something Elden Ring recently figured out actually, like running while enemies are nearby makes you shed stamina while sprinting, but just running generally around won't. Climbing will reduce your stamina, but vaulting over a table would not, things like that. I mean, this kind of is just objectively more fun, right? I mean, how can my character expect to fist fight dragons if a mere 10 meter dash totally gasses them? So that's our list. I want to see what you guys think down in the comments below. What do you think about these open world game tropes and how would you fix them if you could? Let us know and while you're down there, could you please give us a like, share, subscribe as well and head over to whatculture.com for more lists and news like this every single day. Even if you don't though, I've been Josh. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you soon.